On New Year's Eve, okay, 2015, New Year's Eve, I decided I was going to go do something different and not going to just watch the fireworks from home or something like that. So, you know, I invited a special person to come and join me. We decided to go out and do something. So on New Year's Day, so when 12 o'clock hit, while fireworks are erupting overhead, I asked Natalia a question that has changed my life ever since asking the question. It was a question that drastically shaped my life. I asked her, will you marry me? And that question has altered the dynamics of our relationship. It altered my immediate moment, man, if, you know, and I would say that her ensuing answer has also, you know, played a part in altering my life. But at that point in time, when I asked the question, I knew there's no going back from here. This is going to change things between us. And we were in the middle of Boston Harbor on a cruise, all right? And so if she had said no, you know, it would have definitely altered my life. I would have jumped in the water and swam home in embarrassment. I might not be here today because of that. So it's changed my life in many ways. See, there are these questions that have the ability to alter our lives. You know, there's questions that greatly influence us. You know, an expecting parent asks, what shall we name her? You know, a well-intentioned coach or mentor asks the question, what do you want to do when you grow up? See, these questions have a way of sparking something within us and changing the direction and and, and putting ideas and, and new experiences within our lives. You know, an upselling drive through attendant asked the question, do you want to supersize that? And believe you me, that is a life-altering question. You don't don't believe me, go check the scale. Go ask your doctor for the lab work. It's a life-altering question. And so we've been looking at some of the questions that Jesus asks. And today, I want you to realize that there are some questions that are heavier than others. There are some questions that really, really impact the trajectory not just of our lives right now but the rest of our lives for all eternity and i think jesus is about to ask that very question the the quintessential question and so i want to conclude our series this morning of tough questions the questions that jesus asked by no means have we covered all of them. we've only done four weeks there are countless questions in the bible but today i want to look at the question here found in matthew chapter 16 so if you turn there. I feel like this is the question that ultimately is the hinge for eternity for every single one of us. It's the question that our eternity hinges upon. Until this question is settled in our minds, we will never be settled. Until this question is put to rest, we will never be at rest. And so, take a look with me. We're going to start off in verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, the NIV. Sometimes I'll read out of the NLT. We'll see here. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, let's pause there for a second, all right? Just look up over here. Stop there because I think it's important that we need to realize where these people were. Caesarea Philippi used to be known as Peneus, Peneus was a place where it was filled and saturated with pagan culture, pagan worship. In fact, at one point in time, there used to be 14 pagan temples in this region. That's a lot of temples. That's a lot of different gods and religions. That's a lot of different beliefs. And currently, when Jesus arrives in this place, the God that everybody is worshiping in Caesarea Philippi is the Greek god Pan. And their worship was very incredulous. Their worship was very immoral. They used to do prostitution in the temple. Okay? It was part of their worship practices. Jesus 
realizes this is a place where they practice goat sacrifices. This is a place where their standards of morality are so drastically low. This is a city very much like the cities, if we were to stop and consider and modernize it, it's like the cities of today, where we work through the modern expressions of perverse morality, of the perverse realities and the sins that we find around us and how people define sex and how they define this and how they define value and character, how they define you know, what is right and wrong, how they twist the things that used to be wrong are now right and, every, and, and all these different things. And while Jesus knows all of that, he says, that's exactly where I have to go before I can ask the next question. So he sets out 25 plus miles to to go all the way to the north, to where Caesarea Philippi is. It's at the base of Mount Hermon, and and Mount Hermon Hermon is where the, the springs of the Jordan River are birthed, where they come out. It's the source So at this place that is absolutely critical for the Jewish people, why? Because the Jordan River was the main artery of life for all of Israel. Out of that stream, out of that river, you have blossoming vegetation and life, and life is possible because of it. In this place that is important to the Jews, this place that is filled with pagan worship and culture, Jesus says, let's go here. Let's go here. And I I think it's important that we stop and realize he's at Caesarea Philippi because here's the point for me and you, church. I want to get real today with you all. We are church family here today, all right? We've come here to worship God, to seek him, to hear his word. We've decided in the midst of a pandemic, we're not choosing to stay home. We want to go to church. Why? Because it's important. Yes, we, we feel that. We know that. And those of you who can't join us yet, we understand so many different circumstances and scenarios. But when you can, you'll be here. I know that. When we come to church, our safe place the place that we want to be, the place where we have things in common, the place where we worship God together. Yet Jesus didn't just go to the temple. Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi. Jesus didn't just go to the pool of Bethsaida like we talked about where the sick and the dying are. He didn't just go to Jairus' house where he was on his way and the woman who was sick touched him and he said, who touched me? Jesus doesn't just go to the broken and the hurting, to the sick, to the elite, but Jesus goes to the places where it's difficult. Jesus goes to the places where, you know what, some people are going to question, why are you here? It's going to be risky for him there. It's going to be filled with immorality. He goes to those places. See, the reality for us, church, is sometimes we have this mindset of, you know what, I'm going to just, my friends, my neighbors, my coworkers, they're going to come into my world. They're going to step into my reality. But the truth is we have to come and step into their reality. When's the last time that we've left our churches, left our homes, left the comfort of our Bible studies, and we said, I got to go to where the broken people are, and I got to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ there. Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi. And if we don't do that, yes, sometimes people will have these questions and desires and yearnings, and they want to figure out who Jesus is, then they might be searching their faith, and they may ask you a question because they see your witness, they see how you live your life, what you believe, that you're about the Bible, that you speak about Jesus. That is all good and well, but it's not 100%. And if we wait for the world to come to us, there's going to be a very large percentage of this world that will be still lost and broken and hurting and in need by the time that Jesus returns. We have to go to Caesarea Philippi. So I love that. Why? Because Jesus, in the word, the gospel tells us, I came to seek and to save those whom are lost. Church, we have to seek those whom are lost. Amen? So let's step out of our comfort zones. Let's go out. And I know for me, this this is a huge tension because sometimes I, I get into this mindset that my job as the pastor is I need to study the word and I need to be ready in season and out of season. I gotta get all of this, package it up in a way. I gotta disciple you. I gotta equip you. I gotta prepare you so that you can go out into Caesarea Philippi. But it's both. I need to do the same and I need to equip you. And all of us, we need to equip ourselves and equip others so that we can go out and do the work of the ministry. That's why Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.12, he says, Timothy, do the work of the evangelist. 
and discharge, discharge the duties of your ministry. Some of us, you know, we're, we might be called to every different field, every different, you know, realm of society. Some are doctors and lawyers. Some are, you know, um, service workers. Some are, you know, in, in the media industry. Some are teaching and wherever it is that you find yourself, you are dispensing the works of your ministry, but also do the work of the evangelist. Always go out into Caesarea Philippi and share the gospel. The question, verse 13, who people say that I am? Let's, let's look at this question. He deliberately brings them here to Caesarea Philippi, a place with the backdrop of pagan religion and cultures, and he asks the first question. He asks his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And the Son of Man is a title that Jesus utilized for himself, and if you look at this in the Synoptic Gospels and the other Gospel accounts, Jesus just doesn't even use that term. All he says is, who do people say I am? That's what he asks. And if Anybody, stop and think about this for a second. If your best friend, Heidi, asked you, who do people say that I am? You'd be like, uh, so what? <laughs> are you kidding me? Why are you being so proud? Why are you filled with so much pride asking that question? If anybody else were to ask this, we'd be like, dude, get over yourself, right? But it's an important question, and Jesus asks it because he knows the confession to this question will be the hinge for all eternity. It will impact you and change you. And so now, Jesus asked the question, and he knew the answer. Remember, we've talked about this. Jesus rarely asks a question he doesn't already know the answer to. But he asked the question to fish something out of us, to, to pinpoint something within our hearts, to bring out faith within us. And so he asked the question to his disciples. He wanted them to carefully think about the opinions. And, and let me tell you, the positive opinions, because there were a lot of opinions about Jesus, some of which were even saying, you know what, you are casting out demons because you are yourself a demon, right? There, there's lots of opinions about him. But here's the deal. There are some that Jesus wanted to parse out. He wanted to get out of his disciples. You've been with me. You've followed me. You've seen my ministry. You've seen the miracles, signs, and wonders. You've heard my teachings. You've done all these different things, disciples. Now tell me, what is the culmination of all that? As we're getting close to the end of my ministry, tell me, who do people say that I am? Verse 14. Look at their answer. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus, the word on the street is that people pretty much acknowledge you as a prophet. You're, you're, you know, some think that there's rumors you know, that you might be John the Baptist, come back to life because you are doing the same things John the Baptist is. So some may say that you're Jeremiah because you're so filled with compassion. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, and he wrote a whole book called Lamentations. That's a whole bunch of crying, right? And Jesus, you are a man filled with compassion. Some say you're Jeremiah. But basically, all of these different people, they surmise Elijah they surmise people who were speaking the truth, who were crying out against the common culture, who, who, people who were challenging the status quo of society. And so Jesus was a form of a prophet, a man who spoke out against people and who told them what they needed to do. He was doing that from day one. And so for us, as we consider this, the question that is being asked, who do people say that I am? They bring out this concept of a prophet Here's the point, church, that we as God's people, we need to be prophets of God. We need to take on a prophetic posture within our society, that we are speaking to what is happening around us. We need to speak and, and give life into the topics of money and how people utilize it. We have to speak life and speak out against what marriage is and, and how people do sex and, and what is you know society's morals. We need to be able to take a prophetic posture and speak and what i love about jesus was all of the old testament prophets 
And then Jesus coming in as the ultimate prophet. It's not just a matter of here, I'm here to say, woe is you, and this is all wrong, this is all broken, you guys are terrible, you're done, it's over, see you later, just quit. No. There is critique in being prophetic, in bringing that prophetic voice, but there also is the second element that is absolutely necessary, and that is that you need to bring in hope. See, Jesus came in the scene and he says, you guys are completely out of the kingdom of God. You are doing everything wrong. It is all broken. You guys are whitewashed tombs. You guys are a brood of vipers. You guys are all messed up. This is totally wrong. But then he says, if you just receive the gospel, you can come into the kingdom. See, it's not about your works. It's not about this, not about that, but it's about receiving the son of man. It's about receiving me, Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the sheep gate. I am. If you haven't checked out the series, I am. Go check it out on our YouTube. It will give you all of those amazing proclamations of who Jesus, he proclaimed that he was. See, we need to bring a balance and say, Here's the critique of why you're not in the kingdom, why you're doing it all wrong. But here you go. Here's the hope and how you can get it right and how you can be included and how you can experience life and hope and freedom and how you're, you can be transformed. And so all these opinions, what were they? They were wrong. Because at the end of the day, we can be half right about something, can't we? We can be half right about something and still be wrong. You know, we need to be 100% right to be right. It's, it's like a vending machine. I can't say, you know what, I'm going to put in 99 cents, and how come I'm not getting my Coca-Cola? Well, you needed to put in a dollar, Brian. You can be somewhat right and still be wrong. And so in this case here, Jesus asked the question. He asked the question, who do people say that I am? And church, just a side note here. Isn't it interesting that sometimes the people who have the least amount of information are the most vocal about their opinions? They have the least amount of information, yet they make these bold doctrinal statements. They make these like foundational, you know, they, they stake their flag on the ground and say, I'm not moving from here because this is truth. But yet they don't have all the information. Have you noticed when it comes to spiritual, spiritual truth, that also happens? People start saying this and that. We have a smidgen here, and we heard a rumor there, and then we start making these dogmatic theology statements that, you know what? Well, God is, and my Jesus is like this. Well, let me stop and ask you, have you actually opened the Bible and read it? Because if you did, you would realize that, no, he isn't that, and no, your God is not this, because God, the real God, the one true God, Yahweh, the living God, is what this book declares him to be. And so open it. You don't have to live off of a smidgen of truth or a rumor that you heard somebody else, but read it for yourself and realize who he is. It goes to show you that a lack of information doesn't disqualify you from having strong opinions. And Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? I'm just trying to bring this out to you so you can hear this and know this and receive this this morning. Why do we care so much about public opinion? How often has public opinion been wrong? Come on, guys, for, for, for God's sake, at one point, we used to think that the world was flat. Public opinion. Well, we're wrong. It's round. NASA has proved that. Right? The, the navigators who've pioneered the maps and the charts, they have proven it to be round. Okay, great. So, Jesus goes on and he makes the question. Who do people say that I am? But I, I want to, and this is the main part here today. He goes on beyond that. He looks at his disciples and he says, yeah, that's public opinion. Half right, somewhat right, yet not fully I know, I'm trying to get to the bottom line here, but now let me ask you the most important question. And he goes on and he asks it in verse 15. But what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And that is a question he is asking to every single one in this room, myself included. It's a definitive question of our own eternity. The question that every single person has to answer. David, Eliza, you have to answer it. It's not mom and dad who's going to answer for you. We have to answer that question. Tony, you're answering it for yourself, and you're not answering it for Janet. We all have to answer this question, 
And that is the critical one that we want to look at today. The question about salvation is going to be defined by what we do with Jesus. What do you do with Jesus? How do you treat Jesus? But notice, it's not about how your uncle, how your aunt, how your your mom, your dad, your kids, how your friends, how your church thinks about Jesus. It's who do you say that I am? It's you and me in the end. When we come face to face with God, it's going to be you and nobody else. Yeah, there's going to be tribes of all people and nations in heaven. I don't know how God is going to make it a way where we can be solely 100% just us and him, yet in the midst of multitudes, we were going to come face to face. It will be me and you, God. And the question will come, who do you say that I am? What have you done with me? How have you treated me? I have come. I have taught you about the kingdom. I have died on a cross. I've done all these different things. I've declared all these things about me. What have you done about me? How have you treated me? Who do you say that I am? Have you repented and believed? This is the question that we have to answer. And so, church, I want us to stop and think about this because we have a lot of plans, we have a lot of desires, we, we've, we look at the church and say the church is about this and that, the church is going to do this, it's going to accomplish that, but before the church can ever be anything collectively, the church is made up of individuals, and we will never be able to fulfill our mission and our calling if we don't fulfill and answer, settle this question for ourselves, before we can be great and do amazing and mighty things for God, we have to figure out our own spiritual life first. You know, on a plane, they, they often, every time you have to get, take off before a plane, they, they show you a, a, a PSA, right? And the PSA talks about seatbelts and this and that, and whatever, what to do in the event of a crash. But one of the things that they talk about is if there is mighty turbulence or, or, or loss of cabin pressure, what will happen? Th- those masks will drop down. And who do they say for you to put the mask on first? Your child? Your spouse? No, it's yourself. You are the problem. I'm the problem. This question needs to be answered, and I think that sometimes we want to do all these amazing things. We want to see God move among our midst, and we want this and that, whatever to happen, but have we answered the question, who do you say that I am? And we have to answer that question every day, all the time. It's not just I answered it once, I said it, forget it, I'm done. We have to answer that question every day because the minute that my priorities start shifting and I start pursuing all these other things and all these other gods, I have realized that I am not answering the question, who do you say that I am properly? I'm answering, Jesus, you're nothing more than second best. Jesus, you're nothing more than my fifth priority. Jesus, you're not the most important thing in my life. Who do you say that I am? And uh, for, the, for the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it quits right here. Here's the deal. I think that a lot of times we look at this question and we say, I got time. I'll answer it. I'm not ready to answer it right now. I'm not ready to answer it today because you know what? I have all these plans. I have all these you know, proposals for my life. I have all this thing mapped out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to accomplish that. I want to do this. I want to enjoy these things. And you know what? I've looked at Christianity. I've peeked behind the curtain. I've talked to some of my Christian friends, and man, they are just so like vanilla. And, and, and they have this life that is just, uh, it's not too, too appealing. They talk about sacrifice and this and that and delayed gratification and and they're talking about heaven and all that stuff. You know what? I'm here today. I want to live in the now. I want to take all I can. I want to experience everything I can. I want to live life by my own terms. And so we say, you know what? I'm just, I got time. I'll deal with that later. But Marvel fans, let me ask you, what about Black Panther? Actor Chadwick Boseman, what about him? I was shocked two days ago at the age of 43 to have died of colon cancer. My wife was telling me, she read an article that he was producing four different movies. He was acting in four different movies and they did not know he was going through the cancer. You know what? People looked at his life and they looked at his, you know, a compliment. Marvel has a new movie slated to to come out from him in 2021, I think. And 
everyone thinks there's nothing but time. What about Kobe Bryant and his daughter and their friends are celebrating one minute and then the next moment gone? See, we think that we have nothing but time, but it tells us in the Bible that, you know what, why do we even know, we don't even know what will happen tomorrow. We are but a vapor, James tells us. What is our life? It appears in the midst and then it's gone. So if we are to say and make plans, we shouldn't even say, yeah, it's definitive. We should say, you know what, I'm making this plan, but if the Lord wills it, it'll happen. See, We need to answer this question. And Jesus poses it to his disciples because I don't care what people say that I am. I want you to stop and I want you to wrestle. I want you to take this question and I want you to parse it out for yourself. That is the thing that every child has to do. Every young adult has to do. Every teenager, every every adult, every person will have to go through this question. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the person who loves you so much. He is the person who died for you. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one who made a plan when there was no way that you could be reconciled to God. Jesus is the one that's right there in the storm with you. He's all these things, but you have to figure it out, and you have to allow him in. And so, who do you say that I am? Peter steps up for all the disciples, and he says, I know who you are. You are. You are. The Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the son of the living God. You know, he didn't say you are a prophet, you are this, you're a good teacher, you're a good man, you're, you're, you're a moral leader. You are the Messiah. You are the one that God has appointed from the beginning of time to set himself apart so that man can be reconciled and be made right with God. You are the one that will come and give us life when we deserve death. You are the one that will come and fulfill all of the scriptures. It's you. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And I love the fact that Peter said living. See, in the midst of Caesarea Philippi, pagan culture, with all these temples, with all these false gods, with all these, you know, religious, you know, uh, thoughts and ideas. Peter says, here, as I look around and I see all of these gods and all of these temples and all of these ideologies and all of these things that people pursue and where they're investing their money and they're pursuing some sense of comfort and uh, um, satisfaction and fulfillment, you know what? You are not just the Messiah, not just the God, you are the living God. See, stop and think about this, guys. We so often go and pursue all these other gods in our lives that are absolutely worthless. We pursue these broken cisterns that are completely unable to satisfy and and hold its water. We go and pursue fame, money. We pursue power. We pursue, you know, retirements and this and that and whatever, vacations and, and toys and all these different possessions. We pursue all this stuff, relationships. But there's going to point, there's going to come a point in time where we're going to take all of these gods that we pursue and we're going to have to bury them because they are going to die. When they die, stop and think about it. When we bury our Savior, what is life on the other side of that experience? When we bury our Savior, what comfort do we get out of that thing which we we worshipped? It's dead. It's not alive to be able to satisfy us, to console us, to tell us that it's going to be okay, to walk with us in our pain. But Jesus Christ is the one who died and three days later he rose again because he is the living God. And so, stop and think about that. Peter is saying, you are the living God. The one that I worship, you are alive in the midst of all the death that is around me. You are the one that I can pursue because you are alive. And because of that, Peter said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Peter said, you are the son of God, and Jesus says, you are Simon, son of Jonah. Like, Jesus connects, and he, he's like, I'm going to answer in the same way that you're answering, but he says this, Peter, blessed are you because flesh or blood did not reveal this to you, but my heavenly Father did. 
The Father in heaven did. See, flesh and blood, a.k.a. your experience, a.k.a. what you encounter in this life, what you, you know, amass for yourself, it has not revealed to you your ability to worship. It has not given you your life. It has not. You may muster all your willpower. And sometimes I talk to people and they say, you know what, I just, I, just need to, I just need to think better. I just need to figure this out. I just need to, you know, set my mind to it and I'm, I'm going to overcome this sin. No, you're not. At the end of the day, our, our willpower is useless because eventually it will fail. It might give us the strength to resist for a day, for a month, for 10 years but our willpower in and of itself is not able to carry us into salvation. It is God's grace and his mercy. It is he, it is God who revealed to Peter that Jesus was the son of God. And it took Peter to a whole new level above the religious leaders of the day because no one was able to say with confidence, you are God. You are the son of God. You are his living embodiment. You are him. Like Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen my father. You are the living God. And so, God gives us the ability, even though we're dead in our trespasses, even though we're stuck in our sins, he allows us to understand who Jesus is through the work of his Holy Spirit. And that's an incredible thing that we need to ask God, God, do it in my life, in my heart. If I haven't answered this question, I need your Holy Spirit to reveal to me who your son was, God. Who was Jesus Christ? Help me to understand it and grasp it and learn it and answer it. And so he says to him, upon this rock, I shall build my church. See, Peter, you have just declared that I am the son of God, that I am alive, that I am the one that is the one true Lord. And so upon you, you know, they're in Caesarea Philippi. The whole city, the whole region was built upon a huge, massive rock face. So there's rocks everywhere. Jesus says, upon this rock, it's interesting. Peter's name, Cephas, that, in the Greek, that means rock. Uh, uh, Cephas, Petros, that means rock. Upon this rock, Petra, I'm going to build my church. You know, Peter, how influential was he in the early days of the church? All the way up to Acts chapter 16, he was the man that was leading the charge, who did incredible things in the early church. Jesus is upon this rock, upon you, Peter, I will be much, but more important than that, upon this confession of your faith, this confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, I'm going to take and I'm going to build a church around that. And how blessed has Peter been? How blessed have we been because of the fact that Jesus took this confession and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the Messiah, the anointed. I am the one that you have all been waiting for. And he gave us something so blessing, something that is such a blessing. You know, I stop and I look around. There's so many relationships here, so many lives, so many, you know, intersections of, of family and life that we have experienced. And I can't tell you how many times me and my wife have been absolutely blessed by you guys. This is what God intended upon this confession that he is Lord. He wanted to build a church that is a blessing. And you know what? When we go through hard times, the difference between us and those who are out in the world who don't experience the blessing of God's church is that, that we have a support system. We have love. We have encouragement. We have faith and hope and opportunity right here within the body. And that's why we have to let go of all the pettiness and all the unforgiveness and all the pain and the judgment and look around and see this is a blessing seeing what we get to do here I, I can't tell when my wife when we received when we had Micah I, I think for the next several months I, we did not have to cook a single meal at the you know any night because there was food being delivered by someone here and you, I can't even tell you how much of a blessing that was when we were not sleeping and understanding what was up from down and figuring out how to keep this little human alive the fact that we did not have to go out there and cook or figure out or go buy groceries, and, like there was food right there. That was such a blessing. You know, when some of you have been sick, and you know, it's not even me having to go show up at someone's house, but I, I pick up the phone and they say, you know what, Sister Claudia was here. And she was praying with me. She brought me something. And you know what? She took care of me and she encouraged me and she sat with me. 
Oh, I heard, uh, you know what, uh, so many countless praise my moms received from, from people who just said, thank you for just being here. Like, this is the blessing of the church. And upon the rock of Jesus Christ, that he is the salvation, he is the way, the truth, and the life, that we will encounter his blessing. We get to encounter each other. We get to encounter his truth. And more importantly, we get to experience the fullness of who he is one day. Because when we answer rightly, you are the son of the living God. And because you are the son of the living God, that changes my life. That affects how I do life, how I live, how I think, how I breathe, how I act, how I behave, how I love my neighbor. Jesus will encounter you. And right after you answer that question, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Amen. But for us, if we've never answered that question and we never come to it and say, Jesus, and I really worked this out and I've really integrated it into my life and it's really impacted me, he's going to say, depart from me for I never knew you. And life does not cease when we stop breathing on this earth. See, some of us are more concerned about the next 80 years when in reality we should be concerned about the next 80 million years in God's presence. So I invite the worship team, we'll conclude here. I went way beyond. But here's the deal. I heard a story of a man who was living uh, in England. He was having trouble hearing. So he went to his doctor and talked to his doctor, said, what's going on, I can't hear? Well, he had a hearing aid, but he couldn't hear because he had the hearing aid in the wrong ear. And it was muffling and blocking his hearing. And so for 20 years, this man lived with this challenge. And when he went to the doctor, he just took the hearing aid from one ear and put it in the other. And this man's hearing immediately improved. What a tragedy it is for so many to live when we get the privilege and the opportunity to have tomorrow, which is not promised. If we get that blessing of living 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, what a tragedy for us to continue for all that time with this problem, with a challenge. Some of us are listening to the wrong voices about who Jesus is. Some of us have not really stopped to understand that. And you know what, for me personally, I'm just gonna be 100% honest with you here today. You know, I've been sick this past week, right, with allergies and, and just not feeling good and all that stuff at home. And I've been wrestling. I'm like, Lord Jesus, there is so many examples of people by faith declaring this and this happening in their lives. Lord, you know, are we believing something that is not really the case? Have we accepted a false Jesus? Have we accepted a false Christianity? And I'm wrestling with this. You know what? I want to own it for my life, and I want my people, I want the church, I want us as a church body here to really own our faith and say, you know what? Everything it says is acceptable, applicable, and it is for me. And so it's making a change and an impact in my life. My concern is, are, are we living with a half-truth? And I don't want that. So I want to leave the question with you. Who do you say that he is? If you haven't answered that question at all, today could be your day. You can answer it today and say, Jesus, you know what? I don't know. But here's the beauty. When Jesus comes into anyone's life, all he does is he says this, come and follow me. He doesn't say, all right, hold on. Let me stack the books. Let me, let me pile it on. Let me get you all the theology. Let me get you all of the doctrines. Let me get you everything. And here's your reading list. Go figure it out. No, he says, come follow me. And as we follow him, as we have a relationship with him, he starts revealing more of himself. He starts showing up. We, and you know what? It's not even the fact that he starts showing up because he's been present all along. It's that we start getting the sensitivity and the internal filters to realize that he's there, to pay attention to him moving, to see how he's answering our prayers and how he's orchestrating our steps like the Bible says. And we start to experience him. So today, if you haven't done that, just say, Jesus, today I need you. I need to answer who you are. I need to start this journey and I really need to press in and start focusing and flexing and, and working, fleshing this out of who you are, Jesus, for me. Dot, you've had a long life and God's been so awesome and, and amazing. 
countless ways. There's been a lot of bumps and a lot of challenges. You know, but we're not promised that we'll have a long life like God has. We need to do it today. Don't wait. Don't waste any time. So let's stand together. I'm going to pray for you. And I'll meet you outside. I'll chat with you. If, if you're of the inclination that you're okay with a handshake or a hug, I'll make sure to give you one. But um, let's just pray. Father, it's just a question, Lord. But Lord, it's the question. I pray that you would help every man, woman, and child in this room to really grapple with this question, Lord. Who are you? Who do I say that you are? And Jesus, if I have the wrong answer or the wrong thought, if I'm on the wrong track, God, change my mind. Lead me to the right people, to the right pastors. Lead me to the right scriptures in the word. Let it just bounce out of the page and speak life into my heart. Let it just transform me and change me in your mighty name. If you've never said yes to Jesus, all you gotta say is, come in and and speak life into my heart God save me from my sins forgive me for my falling and shortcomings and my depravity forgive me Jesus and change me be my Lord my leader my Savior and if you do you start a journey that is going to revolutionize your life for the better When my wife said yes, you may open your eyes. When my wife said yes, it changed my life. And I didn't tell you how it changed it, but I have a beautiful son. We have a nice home. We have a companionship with one another. We have joy that is beyond what I've ever experienced before in my life because this decision changed me. Jesus is around to change your life for the better, not for the worse, not to take anything away from you, but to give you life and give it to the fullest. Amen. I love you. God bless you.